he said, try to do some Lord Buckley. And of course I had already heard, I think I heard my first album of Lord Buckley actually in the big house on Harmony Hill in downtown Fair Oaks where mm -hmm. Paul lived. And I think might have been Paul's album actually when I first heard the first uh, licks by Lord Buckley. So uh, I took Peter Kors' advice and I learned a couple of uh, Lord Buckley's routines. And I was doing them one night in Santa Monica and a friend of mine brought Lady Lord Buckley, Lori Buckley, to the gig, and I got to meet her. And uh, pretty soon she's been in my shows several times, and it's always a pleasure to be working with her. And we've uh, we decided to start doing these shows and uh, stirring up this information about Lord Buckley. She has lots of plans for uh, 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 documentaries and things like that, and we're working in that direction. Uh, in April, we played a, a jazz show in Tucson, Arizona. So uh, we've got it cooking a little bit here and we're playing around with it. So I hope you'll enjoy. Tonight, you're gonna hear stuff uh, and see pictures and things that nobody's ever seen before. Plus, you're gonna get to meet Lady Lori, Lady Lori Lord Buckley. And I wanna <laughs> bring her up here right now. Come on up. Lori. I'll tell you right now, this is a really wonderful human being. So I'm going to turn it over to Lady Lord. Would it embarrass you if I told you that I love you? Oh. <laughs> That's how Lord Buckley's thinking started his concerts because he truly meant it. This has been a long journey, uh, its lordship, because, oh, by the way, all of you are ladies and gentlemen of the royal court. That is what Lord Buckley believed in. He believed in the nobility of the gentility. And he was so much fun. It was just so amazing. The picture that you see up here, I had known that that was dad. I thought it was part of my grandmother's photographs because they were all kind of old. But this was my dad before he launched into show business when he went to see his brother Lester in Aransas Pais. And he thought he was going to you know, work the oil derricks, but it didn't work out that way. And, uh, but this is Lord Buckley. I said, oh my goodness, I had him when he was just barely 22, you know. But he was an artist, and as we all know, how thrilled I am, of course, to be around jazz. And yes, Charlie Parker hung out in our pad. <laughs> how many people can say a thing like that? But he, why he came there, and why there was so much love between them, is that Lord Buckley loved all people. He particularly loved the jazz talk, the beauty of the hip talk, and it was, which was cool, it was right and tight and happening and everything was beautiful. And Charlie Parker, of course, the amazing talent that he was, he would come over and chill out at the pad. He didn't care if he double parked that, padlock, that Cadillac out front. He wanted to come up and mother said, we never knew if his lordship was going to show. He'd come in, they'd cook him a steak, and make a beautiful salad for him. And I didn't realize until much later in life what a genius mind he was, what a great intellectual. And to be born in a time when people of color were suffering from the ignorance of those who did not recognize the beauty of what father called the American Beauty Negro, who had to laugh at so many things that were not funny and tell it deep in the wells of their humor. And uh, I can't tell you how happy I was when I got schwabbed by National Geographic, because my dear friend Christine gave my brother Fred and I a little Schwab kit. So I got Schwab, and when I got back the results and found out I was came all the way from Africa, I was so happy. <laughs> I said, that is the greatest thing. I'm so hip and so beautiful. And I didn't know about the Ice Age and keeping people in Africa and how it worked, but I was so happy to be a part of something so beautiful. And Lord Buckley, you know, he was quite, he was a Tuolumne born young man, raised in Tuolumne and Stockton, and he was a wild boy, and they were wild children. The gold rush was coming to an end, but his father was from Manchester, England, where they had raced horses, his dad ran racetracks, but the boys had to clean the stables and give their money to the church, and my dad's dad said, hell no. <laughs> Got on a ship, went around the long way because there was no Panama Canal, and landed on the docks of San Francisco, where the rage of the gold rush with a dream of the people to find a way that they could own themselves and not be beholden to the other people. Well, 
My grandpa became a minor, but before that, he married the amazing Annie Laurie, uh -huh. which I was very lovely to be named after for her dad wanted to call me surprise. <laughs> I said I would have been the moon unit of 1949. <laughs> So Ed Sullivan had stepped in and he goes, Dick, you can't name your daughter Surprise. He says, yeah, that's not right. So he named me after my grandmothers. Well, needless to say, Lord Buckley's family were in the mining business. His father came home every two years to make babies. And, uh, and they didn't really know him, but their mother told them that one day, a man would come off a train and he'd be in a beautiful uh, shirt with his knapsack folded neatly over his shoulder. And she says, when he comes, you must tell me right away. So one day it happened that way. And the kids let Nell, she was only like seven, dad was about five, and they saw this guy get off the train. And they ran, she said, they slapped through the, 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 the fences and the broken boards, and they go up and they see this man kissing their mother. Well, just to give you an idea, his father had taught them all how to swear when they were children. Because people that might molest them don't want a child to yell at them and curse at them. They wanted the well-mannered child. Well, they didn't get that in the Buckley family. So they saw this man kissing their mother and he, what are you doing, you SOB? Get off my mom. And they're just cursing at him and yelling at him. And he looked over at him with a love look and said, hello, son, how you doing? <laughs> it worked because here were all these amazing people that we all know and, and are a part of a life finding its own way. But Lord Buckley, even at five years old, was singing for the drunks in Tuolumne. But you know, they only, um, uh, Tuolumne was such a little town, but they had more bars than they had grocery stores. Because <laughs> digging for you know gold and stuff couldn't have been the coolest thing. But Lord Buckley chose to sing for the cowboys, him and his aunt Nell. The nickels and the dimes that they spent, and Nell managed to convince him that the nickels were worth more. But then one day, it wasn't going to happen that way. And when he found out, he chased her with his little pocket knife and he cut her and he just cut her thumb a little bit and she squeezed it extra hard to make it bleed some more. And she told her mother, look what little Dickie did to me. And she made him tell her the story. She told him the story, she goes, you deserved it. Now that was frontier justice. Well, Lord Buckley would be, I call it the American love story. For love is such a powerful thing, and I realize that his lordship comes up now to be a part of a generation that requires more love and compassion to stand up against racism and injustice. And so Lord Buckley is surfacing again. We have a chance to bring to you the people that he influenced, the stories of love and adventure trapped in old languages. Lord Buckley brought them up to snuff and the way he spoke about them in the hip talk and the beauty of the rhythm and the swing. And that's what Lord Buckley brought to us, to give us hope that we were beautiful and that we were magnificent. And it is true. So tonight we're going to show you, it's a very special night. Uh, I have a, brought a piece called Too Hip for the Room, which is a trailer that talks about Lord Buckley because there is a, do a documentary in the, in the works and uh, it's very exciting for we've waited a long time but as i mentioned to my children there are times when times don't work for what may appear to be the right thing but in this day of desperation in a world that doesn't appreciate the beauty of its people these are the days when lord buckley will return to remind them that they are all ladies and gentlemen that they are beautiful and they must love one another they must stand up and that is a pleasure of a message for me to mention to you. So you're going to get to see a piece put together by a gentleman named Michael Monteleone, who has lordbuckley.com, and we are now working together, him on as many interviews that he's done, me on being me, and also the pleasure of bringing the story of the royal court for all of you to enjoy. So may we roll that video? Okay. All right.
Who's this guy? I thought he was black. He was a little bit nuts. And they go take natural sound of the sound of beauty. And he said, South upon the terror. Say here, this is preaching. This was jazz. He said, this young man to the right, to my left. He said, bring, ooh, ow. He said, bring the arms, the arms of the... He said, flop, take, flop, come in. He said, fire, they said, fire. This is music. This is poetry. So it all, Lord, what He said, take insanity, and they said it. Lord Buckley, the hipster's hipster. Comedian's comedian is still, some 50 years after his death, comedy's greatest kept secret. Vaudeville, early television comic, and finally, a tuxedo dandy speaking jive with the voice of a black southern preacher. While peers such as Mark Saul and Lenny Bruce enjoyed ever growing popularity, Buckley continued to toll largely unknown in the small jazz clubs and coffee houses of Eisenhower's America. Lord Buckley spoke the language of jazz, and in the paranoid days of the Cold War, he preached. Deep, that old man. Yet this profound man, in a profane said, failed to catch up. His brilliance was known to only a select few. He may simply have been too hit for the room. <laughs> Seriously, because we believe in the 
this gentility of behavior. That's a lovely thing to create. Prince Charles. Maybe today, Lady DeWitt, the rebellious Duke of Topanga. Prince, Prince Charles of Griffith. Prince Minsky. The Princess of Sweat. The noble Drew Ali. Lord Scott. Jane Goldberg. The head of Prince Sam. The Duke of Bidbidi. This is an interesting group of people. Even Fellini is going out on the world to be. <laughs> Any artist who Lord Buckley. Oh no, 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 go back, go back. Oh. Oh. Entertaining the soldiers before they leave, and there'd be Lord Buckley doing six shows a day and entertaining and making them laugh. He said out of a hundred people he'd be performing, maybe only ten would be able to uh, get because they weren't afraid of semantics. They were afraid to uh, hear no. drops in the 50s. Well, we know what Ray Fox said. <laughs> but Lord Buckley said the Naz instead of the Nazarene.
my lords and my ladies of the royal people. Most humbly and most restfully, I would like to express my deepest reverence for our great and most precious American saint, Abraham Lincoln, and for the mighty riff he laid down there on the fields of Gettysburg. Now, let me give you cats and kitties just out of sea with that day. You see, every cat that swings with the rhythm of love of life has some certain cat he digs more than he does the next cat. You take that cat standing over there by that tree. Now, he's a G.O.T. Washington cat. He digs, ducking the flow and stopping the wall. But that cat right next to him, he's a Benny Franklin cat. He digs, checking his cash and cooling his stash. And that cat right next to him with the feather in his hat, he's an Eisenhower kitty. He digs, let's not play the fool and lose the cool. And that pretty chick right next to him with those violet eyes and that crazy look, she's a Sinatra chick. She digs sweet rhythm, swings the world. But me, <laughs> I'm a Lincoln cat. I dig old, sweet, long, lanky, non-stop Abe. Lanky Link, they called the cat back in them days. Well, sir, Lanky Link went to a speechifying one time, and he had himself a little misunderstanding. You see, there was this here LP type talking cat there by the name of Eddie Everett. And this here cat got up on the podium and wailed away and beat on his chops so long and so loud that he shaved the place 27 times, rearranged it nine, adjusted it twice, and the cat's still up there beating on his chops. And old Lanky Link's over here in the bleachers, goofing with his scratch pad, trying to get something down. And he's getting something down, but what he's getting down ain't moving him. But when they called old Lanky Link up to the podium, and he dug all them cats and kitties swinging on the green sward. A great love look come on his saint face. And he put this issue down to him. He said, Four big hits and seven licks ago, I before daddy swung forth on this sweet ruby land. A jumping, stomping, wailing, swinging new nation. Hip to the cool, sweet groove of liberty and solid scent on the ace link that all you cats and kitties, red, white, and blue, is created level in front. We're now hung with a king size main day civil drag. Sounding whether this nation or any up there nation so hip and so solid scent can stay with it all the way. We've stomped out here to the hassle site of some of the waste jazz blown in the entire issue. Yeti's mother boy. And we've come to turn on a small soil stash of the original site as a final sweet solid pad for them that laid it down and left it there so that this jump and happy beat might blow forevermore. If we can all dig, that's the straightest thing. But digging it hard from afar, we cannot meddle. We cannot put down the stamp of the naz on this sweet sod because the strong non-stop studs both digging it and dug under it, who hassled here and meddled it with such a wild, mad beat that we can still hear it, but we can't touch it. Now, the royal cats may sure dig in their long stash in their weeds while we'd be beating our chops around here, but they can never successfully shade what he bends. They advanced him. It's for us, the swinging. To pick up the dues for these departed cats and fly it on through to Ensville. It's hipper for us to be signifying to that glorious gig we can't miss with all these bulging eyes. That from all these ace stamp studs, we double our love kick to that last sound of the young bone.
long of the beat of the bell. And we hear one that stood up straight for all the day. That these departed studs shall not have split in pain. And that this nation, under the great swinging Lord, shall swing up up water of an endless party grow. And that this nation, and that the big law of you strengths, by you cats, and for you kitties, shall not be scratched from the big race. And that's why I'm a Lincoln cat. Thank you. Purposes and their dark spots pointed out, and the uh, white angelic wings of their full beauty ignored that they are very, very strong and beautiful and honest and uh, sincere. A Renaissance, uh, I'm supposed to be a high sahib of the beat generation. I, I suppose I've been a beatnik uh, all my life, I guess. Now it gives me great pleasure to present a poet from right here in the Bath City. Somebody you all know, and this fellow has, was here the last time uh, that uh, we did a show about Lord Buckley here. Um, it was a great show then, and we're very happy to have Chris Olander back with us. Chris? Yeah. So, uh, Paul, the piano's not on. And uh, I am here to uh, fortunately represent a, con a continuation of what uh, Buckley was doing. Um, it's been many years since we did this. Uh, 1988, I think, was the last time we did that. Yeah. Let me move some of this over here. So I'm here to uh, entertain you to a certain extent. I believe I'm going to entertain you. We'll find out. <laughs> Tonight, we're going to honor man's best friend, the canines. Tonight I will lecture on the aesthetics of Aristotle and how his timeless unities are utilized for our postmodern contemporary mindset. This lecture will structure modern and postmodern artists as examples beginning with the birth of William Turner's ecstatic visions from the early 1800s and finish off the lecture with the 21st century hipsters, flipsters, finger pop and daddies, and mamas. However, I must warn you, do not let the jargon steer you off of your destination. We must keep that clear where we are going. The power pack incendiary cartridge unit refers to our beloved combustion engine car that we love dearly. Though it is killing us that we dare not call it the rough beast slouching us toward Bethlehem. To facilitate your comprehension and meaning of the terms, images, and metaphor applications, Maestro Looney Hendricks will color the raw texturing with his ethereal ecstasies. The metallic lake shine blinds me in the pineless pine tree shopping mall as I enter this asphalt deal. Cruise an aisle in the incendiary cartridge's futurism. You turn, cruise the next aisle into a slot for my power pack stop in Lake Brilliance. I slip the key to the ignition slot, roll up its window, in a jar door into July's tarnished air and step into it. With squinting eyes in a peripheral vision. Rawr, 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 rawr. I jump back against my cartridge power pack, hands put in the face, arms, neck. Rawr, 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 rawr. on the inside door glass of the incendiary cartridge in the slot beside me. Lashing lathers with a two-inch slit in its window. 
12 inches to my solar plexus. Rah, 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 rah. So, I recover composure in pee-wet pants, wipe sweat from my forehead, temples, and cheeks as the black and copper body beats. trapped! It's incendiary cartridge power pack unit. I gaze out across the light lake's metal heat. And imagination gels. I look down into the beast's eyes. Closer. I scrutinize the raw elements contained in its cartridge power pack unit. With my teeth four inches from slit in window. Rawr, I growl. The beast snarls, growls, and spits through across the glass, and then soft black nose smears impressionistic light reveries. Accentuating populistic ecstasies, inspiring climaxes juxtaposed in lunge after lunge after lunge after lunge. Lather me down the glass. Hind claws brace deep in blue glory, well stitched bucket seats. I contort symbolistic expressions into missing motifs. Palms open, fingers writhing, distortion, flicking taunt to the power pack piece, intensifying claws to rip out the little buttons. Shred barber stitching to quote patch one patty. But hind claws catch stiff in mesh support bagging, jam muzzle and left canine into open with a slot. Stuck. <laughs> Odd. Odd. Front claws, slash down, blue by little barrel. Rise, slash down again, again, materializing these white wisps of cloud swirl. Reminiscent of Turner's sublime mist veils across blue vinyl sky. Tooth and muzzle are still stuck. Pinches nostril, the beast spasms, hind claws, rip from seats, worse with them. Catch chrome and model panel deck console at joint, tear it off, and fling it against the controller's door. It cracks just like cheap plastic brakes. Tooth and muzzle are still stuck. So, I spit on the beast's nose and blow my life's mucus up his nostrils, frantic barks, rage, sneeze, howl, and jerks back to our glass. And blood stains a shattered pattern, resplendent in cubic proportions of Picasso. <laughs> the beast slinks into the incendiary cartridge's fourth dimension, smearing dark scarlet passion abstractions and a psyche of abandonment ejaculations of expressionism as I circle the summer blue four door cartridge power pack happening. Brewing coloration frenzies, the beast pain subsides. surfaces across the White's Lake. Imagination improvises contemporary realism, igniting spontaneous da-da. I slip my wrinkly fingers into the cartridge controller over the window slot. Teasing! The beast snarls, growls, and barks repeatedly. So, for desired highlights, I squeeze in dirty red bandana texturing, dangling it. The beast snarls, growls, lunges and grabs it, and we tug at it, portraying the classical balance perspective theory. I jerk it strong to emphasize modern taste in equilibrium distortions. The beast frothy foam smears lip blood. Flaring Kandinsky and white squirrels in a glass 